Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of the Caro Khan vs Everything speedrun. In this speedrun, I'm playing t two 10 minute rapid games. I've now decided to introduce 5 second increment because I don't work well with no increment. I can't do the time pressure and explain what I want to explain during the game so that you guys can understand my thought process. We're essentially just playing the Caro Khan with both the white pieces and the black pieces. So with white C3 and D4 and with black c6 and d5 and regardless of what we play against and also importantly we are not going to be playing any london structures even if my opponent allows it when i play the white pieces and you'll see what i mean if we get those types of positions anyway with that being said let's get into game one all right so we do have the white pieces in game one against ganesh g from india we'll be starting with c3 which is technically the Saragossa opening because you can't actually play the Cairo Khan with white. But you can get close. You can get close. We'll see how our opponent responds. Of course, he doesn't have to play e5, which would lead to like more of a Cairo Khan. He goes d5. Of course, I could play d4, but then our opponent can't play e5. So what I've decided would be a better setup is to start with a3 to give my opponent the opportunity to take the full center and then go into a Caro with a three already on the board. And this is kind of like an improved version from even the black side. You can go for a six quite early on, or even on move one, I've seen people play it. I think it's called the goat or the ghost, one of them. I've heard people call it different things, but essentially it just takes up the B4 square and allows you to potentially play B4 in the future. So it's just a nice inclusion. My opponent still doesn't want to take the full center with e5. If I go d4, we might get an exchange Slav type structure, but I still think it's viable. a3 is always a healthy inclusion to stop any bishop coming to b4. My opponent goes e6 and locks his bishop away. If we go bishop f4, we're going to get more of a London setup, and like I said, we're going to be avoiding that. So let's go knight f3. Okay, knight c6. We can go e. We can go e3. We can also go knight bd2. We could take, but I kind of want to wait for his bishop to develop first, and then we can think about taking. So he has to waste an extra tempo. And we could actually try and play some Slav type ideas with, um, let's just say like bishop e7, takes takes b4, bishop b2, and then looking for c4. If we do go for that, then I would like a pawn on e3, and I'd like a knight on d2, so that we support this square, and we also support c4 with the knight, as well as the bishop. So I think I'm going to start with e3. Our opponent could lock the structure, but then I think we could shift our focus to making e4 the target move and the big pawn break with moves like knight bd2. Our opponent goes queen b6. Okay, he's still obviously not threatening to take us. We have more than enough support on the d4 square. So I'm just going to play knight bd2 and develop. This bishop could come to d3. And again, if c4 is played, we just retreat and e4 is the idea. We could also go to e2, but there's not really any point because this bishop is never coming out to g4. Because he's obviously already played the e6 move, so that's not a concern. Um... I quite like this position. I kind of just want him to develop the bishop so I can take. Okay, knight f6. Let's go bishop d3. This is just a nice diagonal to be on, right? It's a bit more active than e2. And I'm, again, not concerned about c4. Because I feel like that just makes it easier for us to break the center open on our terms. And the c4 pawn could become weak if d5 gets undermined as well. So I think castles makes a lot of sense. Oh, he does go c4. Hmm, I don't know if I like that from him. Because this is kind of like, in my mind, kind of like a collie sort of system. Where we have e3 on the board. And we're going to castle. But because black doesn't have c5 to challenge our d4 pawn, it means we can play e4 with absolutely no concern about defending d4 if you understand what i mean we can just solely focus on making e4 the idea open this bishop up open this bishop up get these knights out the queen out and the queen side is completely safe like my opponent would have to play moves like a5 b5 b4 to try anything 
But even then, he's not actually threatening anything. If he goes for a move like b3, we can always just retreat the bishop if we want. So I think castle, again, e4 is of course on the cards, but I don't see a need to rush it. My opponent could go e5, but then I think we can just take it and then shift our focus to the weak d5 pawn. Um, because it would just be a backwards pawn, because this pawn is on c4 rather than on c6, where it would, you know, be defending. Okay, bishop d7, rook e1 looks pretty tempting. We could also just push straight away. I think I'm going to push. I think I'm going to do it. Let's not waste unnecessary time about this decision. I think that if everything were to get traded on this square, c4 would not only be weak, but... We'd also open up the e5 for our rook, open up our bishop. We also have good control over e5, and it becomes very hard for him to go e5 with an open e-file that we could exploit with a rook. Okay, bishop e7. Logical. I don't see an instant way to exploit c4. I'd love to go bishop f4, but obviously the queen. And if I go bishop to... Uh, bishop g5 takes could take back and allow some trades but I think I'd like to keep these bishops on the board for now I don't want to trade them off for no reason we could go for a move like knight g3 just to decline the knight trade but there's also no need let's just go rook e1 let's just get on this because his pawn break is probably e5 so if we can disallow that then that's probably good news for us Queen e2 looks like a good move, just targeting this pawn, centralizing the queen, making it easier to connect the rooks. And then if he takes, we can take with the queen as well, which I think I quite like. Yeah, let's do it. Put pressure on c4, just defend the knight even more, and of course we're indirectly putting even more pressure on the e5 square to make it even harder for him to break in the center. I think c4 was probably a bit of a positional mistake. He should have tried to keep the pressure on my d4 pawn, because now it's just incredibly strong and very, very solid. Okay, what's the plan? So, I feel like we've improved a lot of our pieces. We have a lot of good pieces on the board. The queenside rook isn't doing a lot, but the rest of the pieces I like the placement of. We could take. Bishop takes, queen e4, g6... Mm, there's no immediate breakthrough. Although, actually, if, let's see, takes, takes, queen e4, he has to go g6 to stop mate. Then we have bishop f4 to attack the queen. Now that our queen defends the f4 square, and he can't go bishop d6 because his bishop is on f6. And we have pressure on the knight, so he has to move his queen to a square like b6 to keep an eye on the knight because we're attacking it. And then I think we have some very nice pressure with moves like bishop to h6, maybe h4, h5. I quite like that. I think that's really strong. I was just saying he could try and take with the pawn and then push f5 to block the diagonal off, but I think that's unnecessary damage to his pawn structure. It'd be interesting to see what the computer says about that, though, because we'll be doing the game analysis, because there's two games, right? And then we'll do game analysis after game one and then game analysis after game two. So make sure you stick around for those. If you want to skip the game analysis, the time stats will be below. But I would recommend sticking around for them. Because obviously I don't know everything. And the computer can help to enlighten me. I don't know why I was so worried, so um, keen about the pressure on the knight. Because the bishop literally defends the knight. So we could just go bishop h6 and not even bother with bishop f4. We could go h4 straight away. And maybe induce h5. That's an option. Definitely a very nice position. A4 would be nice, but he has B4. I don't want to allow B4 too easily. Um, Bishop F4. We could try and sneak into D6, maybe. To target the Rook. But I don't see what that actually does. Let's throw in H4. H4 can't be a bad move. Because if he allows h5, then fantastic. We get to break apart his kingside structure a bit. 
And if he pushes h5, all that does is mean g6 is less defended. And we might have tactics in the future if we can kick this rook over of like knight g5, knight f7 and exposing a weak g6 pawn. In fact, that might actually be really, really strong. So let's say h5, bishop f4, queen b6, bishop d6, rook e8, bishop c5, queen back to c7, knight g5, then we would be threatening knight f7, king f7, queen g6, and that would be mate. I think that's a very strong line. And a very well, even if we don't get that exact line, I think it's quite a strong idea. We could start with bishop h6 to kick the rook and then go knight g5. I think that's quite good because king h7 isn't playable as we control that square. And if he takes our knight, then he's busted. Let's go for it. Bishop h6. Bishop f4 might have been fine as well, but... Yeah, bishop g7, though. That just allows us to trade bishops. We could drop back. But I think we should just take the bishop. Because the dark squares are very weak around his king now. Maybe we should have thrown in bishop f4 first. To kick the queen and then go in. But either way, we should be good. I'm considering knight g5 to play rook e3, rook g3. Or rook f3, I suppose. As long as we make sure e5 can't be played. That's the important thing. So we could go for a move like knight g5, f4. To just lock down this square. The knight could maybe transfer to c5, potentially. Some point. We also have this opportunity open in some cases because even if rook takes then g6 hangs it won't be as crushing as the line that i was briefly looking at before which was of course not forced whatsoever but whoa hmm. yeah f5 is lashing out a bit so knight e6 is of course the first move that should be on your mind because we're checking the king and attacking the queen so, knight e6, if takes takes, then we just up a pawn. And we have a pass d pawn. And the king is very weak. If we take and he moves his king, then we just take the queen. Then if he takes us, then we take back and we end up like two pawns up. Actually, no, the rook hangs. So we end up a lot of material up. Knight e6, bishop e6, queen e6, rook e8. We could go into two rooks versus a queen, but I think queen d5 is probably better. Our bishop is somewhat locked out, but we could transfer to f3 maybe. Or there could be tactics, maybe. I think, um, oh, wait, is queen e6 stronger? So obviously knight e6 is playable, but what if we've changed the move order with queen e6? Queen e6, bishop e6, knight e6, we win a whole piece. Queen e6, he doesn't have to take us. So let's say he goes rook e8. Then we can go queen d5. And I think it's even better because we keep our strong knight on the board. Because our knight is really a pain. Yeah. Queen e6. This looks really good. And importantly his queen is undefended. So he can't take our queen. Let's go. Tactics on the board. On the board. Queen sacrifice. Well, not really a sacrifice. But technically a sacrifice. Very nice. If um, if you enjoy this. If you, if you, if you saw that move before me by the way, then fair play. But um, if you're not subscribed to the channel, then what are you doing? Right, I just live action explained my thought process to a queen sacrifice. I hope that's quite useful for some of you guys. And maybe it's entertaining for some of you higher rated players that saw it instantly 
and it took me like two minutes to see it. But, you know, Knight E6 would have been great as well. We would have just ended up a pawn up with quite a strong position. But I think Queen E6 is better because even if he goes Rook E8 and Queen D5, we get the same position except the Bishop and the Knight are still on the board. And typically when you're up material, you want to exchange. But here, his Bishop is horrible because all his pawns are on light squares. And my bishop isn't great either because it's hard to get through this f5 pawn. Therefore, I want my knight to stay on the board because it's putting so much pressure on. Yeah, the reason I said rook a e8 rather than rook f e8 is because rook f e8 allows queen f7, which was the whole point of keeping the knight on the board. And no matter where my opponent goes, he's going to get checkmated. So that was why you needed to go rook a to e8. Sometimes it's difficult to spot these tactics from the defensive side, but you've got to watch out for them. And yeah, my opponent, I think, is about to realize that he's completely lost and he resigns. So that was a very nice game. I'm very happy with that. It'd be interesting to see what the computer thinks about this. So let's get into the game analysis. All right, so the game review, uh, game analysis like accuracy thing was very good in this game got 92.8 percent my opponent was 74.3 and i had a brilliant move which i assume was the queen sacrifice um i don't know if i would count that as brilliant maybe great but yeah still pretty good pretty good and i had one in accuracy so it'd be interesting to see what that is um but yeah let's get into the game analysis so c3 uh d5 the reason I didn't go d4 immediately and instead went a3 is to give my opponent the option of e5 and then go d4. And this is sent essentially just like playing the Karo Khan with the black pieces, right? If you just like reverse the colors, this would be the Karo Khan, except I have the inclusion of a3, which can only be beneficial because it stops any bishop or eh, any bishop or knight from coming to the b4 square. So this is what I wanted to give my opponent the opportunity to do, but he didn't. He instead went for c5, and that's fine. We go d4. Now, I could play knight f3, but like that's the other sort of normal developing move. But then my opponent can't play e5 anyway. Technically, I could remain in like the spirit of the Karo and try to go e3 to encourage e5. But then after d4, it's not a caro anymore because c5 is on the board. So I didn't want to do this. Maybe if my opponent had played, I don't know, a move like mm, knight c6, let's just say, then maybe I would go e3 to encourage e5. But then this is also more of a French rather than a caro. Anyway, anyway, doesn't matter. These are all... It's just stupid openings. Let's not worry about it. So d4. Uh, my opponent goes e6, which kind of surprised me. I, I expected a move like knight f6, maybe knight c6, maybe bishop f5. I thought those were probably more natural. But I guess he was just worried about me taking on c5 and wanted to make sure it was defended. Because to be fair, if you play a move like knight f6 here and I take, maybe it's difficult to win this pawn back because b4 is very well supported to support the c5 pawn. Um, although the computer likes g6, bishop g7 to get on this long diagonal quickly. Either way, he defends. I go knight f3, knight c6, e3. Queen b6 was an odd move. I didn't really understand the point of this, because my bishop hasn't developed, so b2 is defended. The queen is just staring at d4, which is you know insanely well guarded. It's just more vulnerable than anything else. The computer likes taking, which I considered. Ah, so you can go b4, bishop e7. And then I guess you go for the whole knight bd2, bishop b2, and c4 idea. Now, I did mention this in the game. This is more of a Slav-esque idea. But of course, that's applicable to the Karo Khan, because they're very similar openings. Especially since my opponent didn't go e5. It kind of is a version of the Slav mixed in with the Collie. In, at least in my opinion. But I didn't do this because I wanted my knight already prepared on d2. 
if I was going to go for this line, which is why I went knight bd2. And I also wanted to wait for my opponent to develop his bishop first, because this would be a very favorable version of what we previously saw, because I'm essentially like a tempo ahead, because the bishop's done a weird dance back and forth, because I've kind of bided my time. So this that was what I wanted to do. That was why I spent a bit longer with knight bd2. But my opponent didn't move his bishop, and therefore I didn't take yet. If he moves his bishop, then I'm going to take, and we get a similar sort of thing to this. This was my idea, although e5 is apparently quite strong, because e4 is threatened, so the bishop might have been better on e2 after all. I suppose, yeah, that makes sense. But, but that's not what happened. I instead go bishop d3 because I wanted to give my opponent the option of going c4, which he did. And the computer classes this as a good move, so it's not quite an inaccuracy, but it's not great either. Because after I drop the bishop back, I really hold the cards in this position with the move e4. My opponent can try and play e5, but the issue is that this weakens the d5 pawn massively, because... The C pawn can't defend it because the C pawn is ahead of the D pawn. And if E5 is played, let's just say, you know, Queen C7, I castle. Let's say he goes for E5 in this position. The computer agrees it is a mistake. After something like takes, 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 knight F3. Mm, oh, that's not that accurate. E4 is apparently better. Ah, exposing the open file. But let's say even if I don't play accurately... And we have something along this sort of line. This pawn can never advance a d4 because I have way too much control, right? And no pawns can defend this pawn. So it's kind of just a permanent weakness in his position. And although it's probably playable, I feel like it's quite uncomfortable from the black side to try and play this. Although e4 obviously makes a whole lot of sense in this position. Because if you start taking then uh, you're going to run into some issues with this type of thing. That's not what happened, though. Queen c7, castle, bishop d7. Bishop d7 kind of surprised me. I thought it made more sense to develop this bishop, but here I strike with e4. I think it was well-timed, because we get ourselves castled first, just in case anything happens, and then we always have the opportunity to move the rook to the e-file if we want to. My opponent takes, which I think was a good idea, because if he plays a move like bishop d6, he gets forked, obviously. So let's say he goes bishop e7. Then I have the option to push e5, and I mean, the center is very closed, which obviously favors the attacking side. And um, this looks pretty terrifying for black. I could even try and move this knight out of the way to, like, e1, and try for, like, f4, f5. If my opponent, let's say, castles kingside here... Okay, his knight is hanging, so let's defend the knight. This might be quite scary, with moves like g4, f5. Whether it's winning or not, I don't know, but like, I wouldn't want to play this. So bishop d7, e4, takes, takes, I think was a like, rational decision from him, although it does weaken c4, obviously. Bishop e7, uh, he could probably trade here. It's probably good for black to trade, because... I mean, my bishop's good, and it's difficult to kick out, but it's not actually doing anything. He can now play moves like bishop d6, maybe rook e1, and I'm a bit better. The computer wants to go queenside, which I suppose makes sense, but it looks kind of scary. And if he goes queenside, we get a very interesting game, probably, uh, with me like playing moves like b3 to try and expose his queenside and open the b-file. But anyway, bishop e7, rook e1, castle, queen e2, I liked this move, and the whole idea is, obviously what we play in the game, b5, takes, takes, and queen e4. And my point was that you have to play g6 and weaken your dart squares, like you have no other choice. I then go h4, because if you don't react to it, then I'm going to go h5, and it's probably best for black to go h5 himself, which is what he does. Knight e7 is the best move, I guess, to get onto these light squares and try and defend the dark squares from there. Which is quite interesting, although moves like bishop f4 look a bit scary. 
if you try and trade queens, then I'm just going to back off. Wait, really? This is... Take, take, bishop g7. Oh, we have queen e4 ideas. So he's in a bit of trouble. Because that's a skewer. But, you know, anyway. I wouldn't have calculated that far, let's be honest. h4, I induce h5. And g4 is apparently a move. Which is crazy. Bishop f4 is the best move. I went for bishop h6. And I kind of saw this line with bishop to d6. And I thought it wasn't actually that good. There is also tactics on my bishop. Because, well, I can win an exchange though. You need to find bishop c6 or you're lost. Mm, difficult line, difficult line. So... The idea is, though, to force the queen to b6 and then go bishop h6. And then if we get the same line in the game, except the queen is on b6 rather than c7, I don't see what the major difference is. If anything, it means these tactics don't work anymore because the queen isn't on a forkable square. But maybe it means that she's stepped off of this diagonal. She's not defending the bishop. I don't know. I think it's kind of interchangeable, to be honest. Bishop h6, if my opponent moves the rook, then I was pretty scared for his chances, to be honest, because this bishop is powerful. If I go knight g5, apparently he can take. But I don't know, I don't believe in this for the black pieces. I'm probably going to lift a rook, and uh, g6 is looking awfully weak. Bishop f6 could be a big problem. So... He trades the bishops, which I thought I think is probably a good idea, considering the circumstances. Knight g5. I'm not actually threatening anything yet, but you can't kick the knight out with a move like f6 because g6 hangs, right? So this knight is just here forever. Again, the maneuver black needs to find is knight e7 to try and get onto these light squares. And I suppose backwards knight moves typically are the hardest moves to find, so you can understand why he didn't find it. But once you see it, you realise that it is actually quite a good defensive resource and it locks down a lot of White's ideas. I'm sure I still could try and push this for a win, but it just might be a bit more difficult. Anyway, he goes F5 and F5 just feels like a mistake. It just feels wrong. Even if, even if I don't have tactics on E6, even if I just retreat the Queen, there's still big problems in the black position. I can go f4 to lock down the e5 square forever, potentially. Let's say uh, queen e3, rook e8, f4. This just means that black can never move and he has a permanent weakness on e6. But of course there were tactics. Now, knight e6 is only marginally worse than queen e6. This was the line I was originally looking at. Rook f, well, rook a8, rook f8, kind of the same thing. Again, I mentioned that I could trade here and just dominate the e-file, but I felt no need to, like, give my opponent a material imbalance and potentially risk something when I can just play queen d5. And I'm just up a clean pawn in this position rather than being up a pawn and then two rooks for a queen and, you know, imbalance. No need for imbalance. Just be up a pawn and I think I can convert this position. Let's say something like a6 to defend b5. Queen c5 is a good move. This bishop might struggle to get into the game. But, I mean, here I'm also threatening d5. So I can actually just invest in the pawn is what the computer says. Maybe rook ad1. If he trades, then I dominate the e-file. And if he doesn't, then I just support the pawn going forward. Maybe I can go a4 to try and break the position apart, but I don't think so. But queen e6 was more accurate, and also more flashy. He can't take, because then I go up uh, just a full piece and a pawn. Because I win a bishop and a pawn on e6, right? I think you understand what I mean. Rook a to e8, in my mind, was the move. And we get the same kind of position with queen d5. But like I said, in this position, if you just compare to this, the major difference is that these two pieces are still on the board. And I thought this was favorable for white. And 
I am correct. It's marginally favorable favorable for white because it's difficult for black to actually move, and I always have threats looming with the knight. The bishop's completely locked out by its own pawns and my knight. Again, I am struggling to develop this bishop to a useful square, but you know, moves like rook d1, queen c5, and d5, like in the other line, I think we're a bit more effective because of the existence of this knight always putting pressure on the king. In the game, though, my opponent just blundered with rook f e8 instead of rook a e8, and then we just have a clear checkmate. King h8 or king h6 is met with queen to h7, and it's game over. So that's game one. I hope you guys enjoyed, and let's get into game two. All right, game one done, on to game two with the white pieces again. So, of course, we're going to start with c3. If you skipped the game analysis of game one, what are you doing? Go watch the analysis. I can't make you do that, but I would recommend it. Either way, my opponent goes e6. I guess he wants to go from more of a Nimzo Indian setup, but realistically, he's not going to go e5. If he goes e6, he's not going to go e5. So, let's just go d4 straight away. And... This looks like it could be a very interesting structure because it's kind of like a Karo. Well, it looks like a Karo exchange version, except we haven't exchanged because we don't have these moves included and his bishop can't get out. So, interesting. Let's start with knight f3. Okay, c5. Interesting. Bishop g5 looks tempting. Thing, but then queen b6 targets b2. We could go bishop g5, queen b6, queen b3. But then c4 is kind of annoying. Although we could go, actually, bishop g5, queen b6, queen c2. But then he could take and expose us on the c file in the future. So I reckon we're just going to go e3. And we're going to kind of actually get a fairly similar looking structure to the last game. Let's go a3 for the sake of trying to play b4 in the future. Because like I said, if we can get a type of position where his bishop moves and then we take and then push b4, bishop b2, knight bd2 and c4, that's quite good. But our opponent doesn't allow it. He instead takes us and we get an exchange variation. And we're going to take with the e-pawn. Now typically you would take towards the centre. I'm instead taking, I mean, it's not away, but it's not towards either. Um, instead of having two central pawns, we now have one central pawn. But this is intentional because I want to open my bishop up. I want bishop d3 to target the king side, castle, maybe moves like knight g5 in the future, knight bd2. And also by keeping the c3 pawn, c3 pawn on the board, we keep a very strong queen side. We have to make sure that e5 doesn't get played because that's probably black's main pawn break. But let's go bishop d3. This bishop is kind of like a London bishop, except this isn't a London, thank God, where it's kind of sheltered by the pawns on d4 and c3, making it difficult for knights to try and challenge the bishop and pawns because he doesn't have c5 c4 because he just exchanged the pawns and if we can stop e5 e4 by stopping e5 then we're good our opponent goes h6 stopping anything from going there which is a fair move let's castle though and we're going to try and claim that it's a waste of a move by not engaging bishop d6 may prepare e5 so i think rookie one makes a lot of sense just to clamp down on the e5 square maybe we put a knight on there in the future he does also take the f4 square away from our bishop which is kind of annoying but it is what it is knight d2 looks logical but i'm not sure where the knight's going after that h3 also looks fine making sure h2 isn't a target and stopping anything from coming to g4 but we can do that at any time Again, I want to try and control e5. We can throw this knight there whenever we want, though. So that's a nice option to have. If the knight goes to d2, we could rotate through f1 to g3. Which would control e4 and keep this bishop open. I don't know where I want to put this knight yet. But putting it on d2 can't hurt. 
Okay, now he is threatening e5. And I... I think this is a threat. I don't want to allow this. I don't want his bishop to open up. So we're going to throw a knight onto e5. And we can put this knight on f3 if he gives us the opportunity. Now he can't take with the knight because then he gets forked. Which is one of the downsides of putting the bishop on d6 even though it is very active. We could play a move like f4 to support the knight but I don't think it's necessary. I don't think we need to. I think we can just go for moves like knight d to f3 moves like bishop to f4 now that the connection is cut off and potentially set up some kind of discoveries in the future maybe i think this is a very nice setup for our pieces let's now defend the knight again if he takes with the bishop then he just trades off his dark squared bishop which is his good bishop because a lot of his pawns are on light squares and this bishop is going to struggle to get out of anywhere which is part of the reason we're preventing e5 to stop the bishop from getting into the game which makes it very hard for him to actually challenge our bishop even if he gets moves like f5 b6 and bishop a6 to challenge us we can play a move like queen e2 to make sure that isn't playable or we can just drop back and say yo you're not even doing anything on this diagonal this is the important attacking diagonal. That's what we can argue in the future, potentially. And we could, you know, create some kind of battery in the future if we want to. Okay. So knight f... Sorry, knight um, d7. He has one, two, three, four attackers on our knight. We have one... One, two, three defenders... So if we do nothing, then after takes, 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 we're going to end up down a pawn. So we should defend the knight. I am checking this tactic. I don't know if anything comes of it. I don't think so. It moves like knight g5 and queen h5. Mm, but the knight can always come back to f6, I think. So I don't think it works. Interesting, though. Is interesting i think bishop f4 is a good move but he does have f6 then if we take or take this should be okay hmm. yeah i'm trying to find tactics on like f7 because his knight has vacated the defense of some of the light squares around the king's position by moving. Knight f7, king f7. Yeah, the problem is we can't get our queen in fast enough. So I think bishop 2 f4 makes a lot of sense. He could go g5. Like, he could. But I feel like that's completely losing. There's no way that works. If we drop back in g4, we just take it. So he can't dislodge defense of the knight well enough. There even could be potential sacrifices on this square to just get an absolute monster attack going. And he goes g5. Whoa. No chance this works. What happens if we take? If takes, 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 we're threatening queen h5 or queen g4 maybe so if take six takes and he takes then he's kind of okay i think i think he can defend himself you know what i think it's a very complicated position if we sacrifice and it may well be the best move i don't want to spend you know four minutes calculating it and being like insanely down on time even with five second increment I don't want to do that. I think the practical option is just to back off. Say, I know g4 doesn't work, so I'm not at risk of losing anything. And all this is, is a weakness that can be exploited in the future. Maybe with h4, maybe with bishop c2, queen d3, maybe with moves like queen h5. But our argument is it's a long-term weakness. Even if we can't exploit it right at this second, at some point I guarantee we are going to be able to. And if that guarantee turns out to be wrong, then um, I guess I just look like a bit of an idiot. But that's nothing new. That's nothing new. Okay, I like this position. We have an insanely strong grip over e5. 
which makes it impossible for his bishop to really get out. They can't even go to d7 anymore, which makes it hard for this rook to get out. And if we can slow play this position with moves like bishop c2, queen d3, and induce moves like... Whoa. That looks incorrect. Because you're taking your knight away from the defense of the king side. And where are you going? Like, nowhere. You're not doing anything. Hmm. Interesting. H4 is definitely a move. It's definitely a move here. Because if you take, bishop takes. This looks very scary for black. Although, we could also take with the knight to try and get the queen in. Which is probably more accurate, actually. And you can't push g4 because we're just going to take it. And then we have forks on f6. We are invading, etc, etc. So h4, what can he do? If he goes f6... I mean, that looks horrible. But we just have knight g4, I think, to again go after these pawns. Eh, to be honest, we probably could have gone knight g4 in the first place. Although knight g4, queen... Sorry, king g7. Yeah, maybe it's not quite as effective. Still good. But not quite as good, I don't think. So I think h4 is a good move. Just asking the question of what are you going to do. If you're going to give me a pawn, then go for it. Your problems aren't solved. If g4, knight g4, bishop g3, pawn g3, queen g3... There's problems. Hmm. Takes on e5. So if we take with the pawn, that's obviously the most forcing line. He has to go bishop e7 to defend g5. I don't think I love that. I don't think I love that. Because there's no immediate breakthrough. Although. Ooh, actually. Pawn e5, bishop e7 hg5, hg5, knight g5, bishop g5, queen g4. How does he defend the bishop? Ah, uh, he can go queen e7. But then we can go bishop f4. How does he defend that? Because if he goes f6, we just take it. Wait, this is an interesting line. Pawn e5, bishop e7, takes, 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 takes. Wait, I didn't do that right. <laughs> here, 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 here. Queen g4. Let's say queen d8. Mm, queen e7. I don't think it matters. Bishop f4. f6 doesn't do anything. Uh, he could go... Well, I was saying he could move his king to play rook g8, but he actually can't. Because we'll give him a check on the h-file. Although, uh, And he can't go to h7, and after queen to h5, go bishop h6, so our bishop controls that square. So I think this works. I think this works. Now, I was only going to play this line if I was confident about this one. Which is why I'm doing it. He could take with the bishop. But after takes takes. And queen h5. It's just game over. Um, I don't see how you stop yourself getting mated. And defend the pawn. Or at least your king's going to have to run into the centre. And you're going to probably lose the pawn anyway. That's probably not good. f7. It will likely fall as well. Um... Yeah, I would have liked to keep a piece on e5, except I think this particular line is too good to pass up. So he takes with the bishop. So I will show you what I wanted to do if he didn't do that. And instead took with the pawn first. But yeah, I think queen h5. I mean, queen g4 is still a good move. Because after a move like queen to d8, or let's say queen e7... We would still have moves like bishop f4. Which still look good. 
it's so funny. His bishop is just locked out of the game. And like I said, this knight needed to be on the king side helping in the defense. And it just isn't. It's just out of the game. Queen h5. Queen, e queen e7 isn't playable because you get mated. So queen h5, queen d8. Check here, check here. Check here. Check. Back. Then we can take. Okay, yeah. That's good. You also can't go for a move like f5 because his rook hangs. Not to mention, on passant, we're coming with attack on his queen. g5 still under attack. The rook still under attack. It's completely game over. And obviously, we'd be threatening this again. Yeah, I think this sequence works, though. After queen d8, queen h7, king f8, queen h8, queen, king e7, queen f6. If he goes to d7, we can take on f7. So if he goes back to f8, we can give a check on h6. And if he goes to g8, then he's getting mated. Yeah, he's getting mated. mated. So if he goes to, back to f8, then... Sorry, no, no, if he goes to e7, then we can pick up the pawn. I think this works. I didn't consider this move, though. Can we just give a check here? Check. We could just pick the pawn up, though. We could just pick the pawn up. I think I'm just going to keep it simple. I don't know if I've missed an easy mate, but we just block his exit. And we could even play, like, I don't know, bishop h4 to keep an eye on this escape route and then mate him with, like, queen h6, queen h7. Which actually looks kind of unstoppable. He also can't play queen e7 because then he just blocks it, the route off himself and then he gets mated anyway. So, if queen d8, then we just give a check, and if he runs to the center, then he loses his queen, and if he runs over here, then he's going to get himself mated, or he's going to, again, get forced to lose his queen. So, yeah, this is completely game over for the black pieces. Like I said, g5, it just came back to bite him. He could not defend his king because his pawns just disappeared. And maybe there was a more accurate way of going about it. Maybe we could have sacrificed a piece for two pawns in the first place. But I knew this was always going to be a problem. And yeah, queen e7 just makes our lives very easy. Because we just give a check. King moves, give a check, king moves. And then we mate him. Because he just blocks off his own retreat with his own pieces. Which is kind of hilarious. Kind of hilarious. Uh, we also could mate him like this but there's no need to be fancy let's just give him a good old-fashioned checkmate keep it nice and simple force the king back to f8 and then deliver a check here yeah like this there we go and there is another win and another pretty interesting game the computer immediately says i made one mistake so that'll be interesting to see where that is I hope you enjoyed the second game. I'd encourage you to stick around for the analysis. Let's get into it. Okay, so another very high accuracy game. 91% for us and 67.9 for my opponent. I made one inaccuracy and I had one miss according to the engine. Other than that, played pretty perfectly. So let's go through the game. C3, E6. I mean, I immediately know I'm not going to get a normal Caro. But we instead go into more of a Slav structure. Knight f3, c5. I wanted to mention, this is kind of like an exchange caro. Because an exchange caro typically looks like this. Takes, takes, c3, and e6. Maybe not e6 straight away, but this is the structure that you tend to get. Now compare this. Now obviously it's flipped. But compare this to what we got in the game. It's very, very similar, right? Um, yeah, it's like white playing against the Karo Khan, except, you know, the C and E pawns are still on the board, which allows my opponent to go for the move C5, right? Instead of the pawn disappearing by an exchange on D5, he can go C5 to try and undermine my center. I go E3 because I don't want to play a London with Bishop F4. 
Knight c6, a3, takes. And taking with the e-pawn is marginally better than the c-pawn, I believe. Personally, I think it's a bit easier to play because we have an open e-file, which we made use of because we were able to stick a knight on e5 more easily. We were also able to open this bishop up, which came in useful on f4. And this bishop's unassailable on the d3 square. This is, a, I believe, a Carlsbad pawn structure. It's a very typical pawn structure where white is missing his e-pawn and black is missing his c-pawn. And then you have pawns on c3, d4, d5, and d6. Basically, white has great control over e5. Black struggles to really challenge it, as we saw in the game. The idea, I believe, for black is to get a rook on the c-file and start advancing his queenside pawns to form a, a minority attack, either to make b4 happen or to potentially stick a knight on the c4 square. And then you probably still want to try and make b4 happen. Often the idea with black is to play an early e5 as well, to challenge my center the first chance he gets, which is why I didn't allow it. Knight f6, bishop d3. I expected bishop d6 here, and my idea was to castle. And you might be saying, oh, but he can play e5 now. No, but he can't. Because after pawn takes, knight takes, I have rook e1, and you are pinned. Apparently you can play on with knight e4. Takes, takes, takes is fine for black queen h5 is apparently very very good and after the bishop retreats I just have f3 and I'm just winning I could also take oh no I couldn't take here because I'd lose the queen what am I on about but yeah basically you can't take but that's what I was expecting my opponent didn't do it he goes h6 instead which is a logical move I suppose Bishop d6, rook e1. Again, I'm just clamping down on this e5 square. I'm not letting him play it. My opponent castles. Knight bd2, rook e8. And now, knight e5 is the only move to maintain white's advantage. Because let's say you play h3. Then, black can play queen c7 to prepare e5, or he can just go e5. And the issue is that too many pieces are getting traded for a start. And black actually has pretty good play. Like his d5 pawn is an isolated queen pawn, sure, but white has no real presence in the center anymore, so it's difficult to actually gain any kind of advantage. Black has a lot of dynamic play around his pawn. Let's say knight f3, bishop c7, bishop e3. White isn't doing anything. I mean, solid enough. Maybe I could have grinded this kind of position for a win. But... Knight e5 is the move, because his bishop can't get out, his rook can't get out, this rook struggles to get out because his bishop can't get out, and you can't really take me. If you take with the knight, you lose a piece, and if you take with the bishop, then I take back with the pawn, knight d7, probably knight f3, f4 is also playable, and again, your piece is just locked out the game. You can't really move very easily, and white has some really good scope on the king side to potentially start some kind of attack. So, queen c7 is the logical move to challenge my knight. f4 is completely playable, but unnecessary in my opinion, and the computer agrees. Knight df3, knight d7, again he piles on the pressure. Queen e2 is playable here, and I did consider this move, but I didn't want to play it because I wanted to leave the option of bishop to c2, queen to d3 open in the future potentially. And therefore, I instead went bishop f4, which is a good move. F6 I was half expecting, but I didn't believe this was good for black. Because even if he manages to facilitate some some trades like this, again it is still hard for him to go e5, and his kingside light squares are incredibly weak. I can go for moves like knight h4 to try and exploit them. Interestingly, I'm not sure this is the best line though. I want to let the computer marinate for a second and see what it thinks. It likes bishop g6, going after the rook, and if you take, then d takes, let's say knight takes. Oh, so I just trade everything here, and then I take the rook, and then I'm just up an exchange. I do give up this pawn, but I'm confident I could win this with the white pieces. I think the black king is too exposed. 
So, yeah, f6, maybe if you calculate it out, you can maybe try and play it with black, but it's very, very risky. My opponent goes g5, though, and turns out you can actually sack on the g5 square, and I think this was my mistake. Well, my miss, right? My miss. So the thing is, taking with the bishop isn't actually that good. And this is what I had calculated, because he can take on e5. Now, if he doesn't take on e5, let's say he just makes a random move, then it's going to be game over. I take on d7, and then I assume I play like queen h5. And um, you have a lot of problems. A lot of problems, right? So, that's what I'd calculated, but I was like, he can just take... And then I'm in trouble because I'm not actually getting in. It looks scary, but my bishop's under attack. I've got a retreat and he survives. Like he can maybe go king g7, bring his rook over to h8, maybe bring the knight back. He's going to survive this. So the idea was actually to take with the knight. And after you take, then queen h5. Oh, and you can't take this because you get mated. So the best move is bishop e5, queen g5. You can't play bishop g7 because your queen is going to hang. So king f8, d e5. I have two pawns for a piece. But it's actually quite a similar position to what we got in the game. The king just can't get out. And we have so much pressure. Something like rook e7... Bishop h7, king e8, queen g8. I'm just following the top computer line. Knight f8, bishop h6. And you actually can't defend the knight. I didn't see this deeply though. This is like, you know, a good 6-7 moves in the future from actually making the sacrifice. So I thought, look, sacrificing might be the best idea. And I was actually right in what I said during the game. Sacrificing is probably the best. But I don't want to calculate it out, and I don't want to risk it. So why not just play bishop g3 and go, look, this is a stupid move. Whether I sacrifice or not, it's a stupid move, and you're going to pay for it. And he did pay for it. Knight b6, not the move. Really not the move. Like, you can't just be stepping away from the king side like this. When I have so much pressure, I just drew some horrible arrows. When I have so much pressure on the king side, you can't just be running away. And I don't understand what the knight was doing on b4. Sorry, on b6. Now, this is apparently the best move, and I think queen h5? Yeah, same sort of ideas. And we probably get a very similar type of position after something like this. Black is just getting mated, apparently. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't know this in the game. I went h4. I also considered... What did I consider? Knight g4. Which, yeah, I am correct in saying king g7 actually does just kind of defend his position. And my best idea is just to put another knight on the e5 square. So h4 is the second best move. And it's tough to respond. He takes on e5. I don't think this was the best. If he takes, then I was just going to take with the knight. And my queen's going to get in. And it's just going to be game over. Um, and it's tough. Because if he goes g4, then I just take it. And he still has all of the problems. This was the line I calculated. Because he could win a pawn. But I can take on h6. I can go to f6. And win the rook. Like, there's nothing. There's nothing for black here. His queen is by herself. She can't do anything by herself. But my opponent takes with the knight. I take back with the pawn, and this is the best move. Now, of course, taking back with a piece is completely viable. But this was the most forcing line, and I'd calculated bishop e7. By the way, taking with the knight is actually the best move. With getting in the queen in. What I had calculated was pawn takes, pawn takes, knight takes, bishop takes, and queen g4. And this is the top engine line for white. If the queen defends with a move like queen e7, then I just have bishop f4 or bishop h4. But either one is the same. And you can't defend. You simply can't defend. f6 I take. And you still have all the problems. And you're probably getting mated. 
I don't see how Black can try and survive this. Knight c4 is the best move. Like, what? And then you take here. And then via some tactics, Black just loses. I could also just take this. <laughs> like, it's completely game over. So, my opponent takes with the bishop, though. We have takes, takes, and queen h5. And you just can't defend yourself. King f8 was the best try. By the way, bishop b5 is the best to cut this diagonal off. And then I guess you're going to try and put this bishop on this diagonal. But either way, we take on g5. And my opponent is just but his, his king's just dead. He goes queen e7, which gives me checkmate in three. But even if he plays a top computer move, which is a6, by the way, like, okay, yeah, someone is, if someone plays that, they're cheating. Probably. Like, although, if they're already losing this badly, they're probably not cheating. And there's no immediate checkmate, but I can lift my rook. I could give a check like this. And I think my plan was to put my bishop on this diagonal. Oh, no, that wasn't my plan. King here? I think I was going to give this check. If he goes to f8, then he's getting mated. Yeah, 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 because I go to bishop 2, h4 and cut this diagonal off forever. And if he goes to d7, then I just win another pawn. This was my idea. And my point was that he, if he moves his king, he loses the rook. And if he goes to d8, he gets checked. So if he blocks, I'm just winning. I'm not winning a bunch of material, but I'm up two pawns. His king's stranded. He can't develop his pieces anywhere useful. And I'm just going to get more pieces into the party. Maybe put the push on h4. It's game over. So anyway, this was my plan, and my opponent just gave me an easy checkmate like this. And there we go. That's the end of the game analysis. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and stay tuned for future uploads.